at that point, though, COVID hit and we didn't have a deal for a while. Uh, but then, then you know, you start revving up and you keep doing the work. You keep doing the reps and you trust yourself and you build uh, relationships with other people that want to partner with you. And that's allowed me to continue to grow. Welcome to The Real Deal, a commercial real estate investing podcast. I'm your host, Aman Shahi. There's a ton going on in the world right now, and much of it impacts real estate investors. The Real Deal podcast will take a look at what's happening and how it influences you as a real estate investor. Each episode is a 20-minute segment dedicated to distilling the day's most important news, so you can stay up to date on what's going on in the world and how it might affect the commercial real estate market. Welcome back to another episode of the Cashflow Capitalist Show. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Gary Lipsky. Hey, Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks, man, for having me. So, Gary, give us your 30-second introduction, who you are. Yeah, so I'm based in Los Angeles. Um, I'm president of Break of Day Capital, a boutique real estate investment firm. We've done a quarter billion dollars in uh, real estate transactions. We won the award um, for the best syndicator. Uh, last year from the Apartment uh, Association of America, which has uh, 139,000 members, I believe. And um, um, yeah, we, you know, we, we focus on a couple markets. We don't do the shotgun approach, so we can be experts in those markets. So tell us, how did you get into syndication in the first place? Yeah, um, I was investing in real estate um, you know, like some, uh, single family house and I did some, um, some flips, but I wanted to get into, you know, I was looking at buying like a four unit or a 10 unit and I learned about syndication and it was a good fit for me. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life and it's like, it's running a business <clears throat> and there's scale, which I always liked. I've, I've grown a number of businesses. So, um, you know, I joined, uh, like a mentorship group and I learned about it and, you know, partnering with others. And we eventually, uh, our first deal, we took down a 42 unit for 1.65 million and, um, uh, you know, just, just learned so much and then just kept growing from there. Yep. Nice. Net. You know, um, somebody was talking like uh, we met two days ago, somebody was talking about you that you started in real estate, like 2017, 2018 in syndication. Yeah, I would say. My, my first investment really was my, my home that I bought in 2002 for my family. Um, you know, our parents, you know, my parents are still in their house. They bought over 49 years ago. You know, they looked at it as forever home. I looked at it as a way to build wealth. And so um, we converted the garage into an office for my business. And I knew I was going to get $700 of rent money from my business. You know, I bought the house with, you know, I had debt. I had no money down. Um, we opened up the uh, the kitchen area, so it was a value add. Little did I know I was going to be implementing that for for deals later on. But I, you know, I really studied growing neighborhoods, and I was trying to buy value there. Um, you know, in the path of progress, and um, but I sold a business at the end of 2016 and got into real estate full time. So I started investing in other people's deals, and I was starting to learn how I could do bigger deals and partner with others at that time. No, my, my question is, you started in syndication around that time. You said 42 units, that was $1.8, $1.9 million deal. But right now you are targeting $60 million deal in like three, four years. How did you uh, like go from there to there? That's my question. Yeah. You know, real estate is a team sport. I know everyone's heard it time and time again, but I, you know, I had a really good business background. So it was just applying to that. And, you know, I, really dove into um, learning as much as I can. And, and and still, like I'm still learning every single day from people, you know, ever, you know, it, it could be someone, a beginner that has a new idea and I'm, I'm open to that. You know, it's, it's constant learning. Things are always evolving, you know, but partnering with the right people, you know, is, is really important. And, and, you know, when we went to our second deal was over 15 million, but partnering with people. And, and, and it wasn't like everyone said yes. I got probably, you know, 30 no's or something from people that didn't know the market, didn't know the rents, um, 
uh, didn't know our underwriting, where the people that did come aboard said, wow, you're super, super conservative. We really like this. And that second deal, we we 2x investors money in, 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 uh, in two years. So, you know, at that point, though, COVID hit and we didn't have a deal for a while. Uh, but then then, you know, you start revving up and you keep doing the work, you keep doing the reps and you trust yourself and you build uh, relationships with other people that want to partner with you. And that's allowed me to continue to grow. Mm. And uh, you also wrote a book for asset management called Best in, Best in Class. It's a great book. And can you tell us what is asset management? Yeah. And, and that book helped me get better as an asset manager, manager too, because I had, a, I had to write everything down. And if I wasn't doing it, I, had, I better be doing it. And and if I had questions, I, I'd reach out to other people. But I, I think a lot of people get confused between property management and asset management. And property management, we don't do it in-house. We hire a third-party company. But there are people that, you know, they'll they, you know, they start at nine, they punch out at five typically. They don't have any um, um, equity in the deal. They're not investors in the deal. You know, they the property management company may work on 30 properties, 100 properties. Um, it doesn't mean they don't care about your property, but you, you know, as the owner, as the asset manager, you're going to care the most about the property. So as an asset manager, we are executing on the business plan. We are dealing with um, obstacles that get thrown in uh, thrown in front of us, and and that happens all the time. It does, it's not a smooth ride to to making you know millions of dollars. Um, there are definitely obstacles in the way. You're dealing with your loan confidence. Um, you're dealing with investors. Um, maybe you pivot and you weren't planning on painting the property, and now you do, or maybe you were you plan on doing something else and you change it up. So it's, it's executing on that business plan and making sure you you're maximizing the value for your investors when you ultimately mm. sell. Mm, nice. You said you guys hire third party property management company and how do you keep them aligned? How do you keep them checked with your business plan? Because they are managing so many properties. Yes. Uh, great question. And um, so what we do is we use a, a Google Drive for our information. So on that, we'll have uh, a task tracker. That's one of the tabs. And so if someone has to do something, um, we, we put it, you know, who's responsible for that? What's the task? When does it do? So it just holds people accountable. And then we'll also have a, a lease tracker to see, you know, where leases get it rented um, renovated, all that information. And then we'll also have a tab for every single week that we own that property. And so we'll have our KPIs on there. Um, we're going to break down every single unit, the occupancy, uh, delinquency, um, work orders. There's just a ton of information. So at any, any point in time, I can look back and see, hey, where were we on, let's say, August 10th last year or February 10th last year, our, is our delinquency higher? Is it lower? Where's our occupancy? So it gives me a lot of data points, not only to measure that property, but other properties as well. So that's a really great starting point. And we have that, we have that call to go over that sheet every single week. I mean, some weeks, if we've had the property for a while, hey, maybe it's only five minutes long, but that's fine. We're still having that interaction over Zoom and talking about the property, what needs to happen, you know, any issues. Um, and, and go over rents if we need, you know, if can we push some rents? Do we need to lower some rents that have been sitting for a while? So we, you know, we're quickly going through because we have all the data, the key points and moving constantly tweaking and improving the NOI every single week, every single month for the length of the of, of the ownership. Now, every single month, it doesn't necessarily mean it goes up. You know, expenses might be higher on a certain month. You might have uh, uh, occupancy dip on certain months, but we're constantly pushing for constant improvement. And what kind of KPIs do you keep in check weekly and monthly? Yeah, well, um, always delinquency, occupancy, uh, pre-leased. Um, and so the difference is we might be at uh, 95% occupied. So bodies in, 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 in units. We may be at 90% economic occupancy, meaning 5% of the units aren't paying rent. Um, and then we may be pre-leased at a hundred percent, 
meaning the other the units uh, that are available, the other five percent are are preli. So we can we can adjust our rents based on that. That's really important. You know, if work orders get really high, hey, does our team need help? Um, um, you know, why is it taking so long? You know, we're we're monitoring a lot of different things so we can find out where the bottlenecks are and provide more help if needed or to to problem solve as, as a team. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. And uh, how do you keep the communication effective with your property management company? Yeah, so having that meeting is really good and having that uh, the task tracker, but we'll email or call during the week if, if need be. Um, you know, they can always, they know they can always reach me if, if there's something important, you know, mm -hmm. if something, hey, a tree fell on a, on a unit and, you know, we're going to have to have an insurance claim, whatever it is. Yes, they, they know they can reach me at any time and I can reach them. Um, so we want to set really good expectations uh, before we take over the property. Like I'm going to return an email within, you know, within 12 hours probably or, you know, maybe a little bit more. And, and I expect the same from them. We, we set really good expectations from the beginning. So they know that there is a, 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 a high level of, of quality that we're, we're looking for. And if we don't communicate that, then they don't know what level of um, quality to achieve. So we're really setting the bar high from the very beginning. So they, they know, um, you know what to expect. So you trying to implement proactive method than reactive method? Absolutely, absolutely. We always want to turn units faster. We always want our team to go the extra mile to pick up the trash on the ground to, um, you know, do a pleasantry to a to a resident or, or go the extra mile for them. And that goes a long way. And so empowering our staff and. Um, making sure they know that they're uh, respected goes a long way because property management could be a, um, um, you know, you, you, you don't get the thank yous as much. You get a lot of people complaining at times, you know? Um, so it's really important to let them know that you have their back and that you care for them and they will work, you know, that extra percentage of, of, of them working harder for you means, your NOI is going to go up. I guarantee it. And then your value of the property is going to go up. Yep. And um, can you tell us how do you keep uh, effective communication with your investors about the uh, how your property is doing, how you are managing it? Because you, that's your investors. They want to know about how are you operating that. Absolutely. So we'll send out a monthly newsletter, um, and that in will include our actual um, financial performance for the previous month versus our budget. Now it's never, never, you know, perfectly aligned, you know, some months are going to be more, some going to higher, but over, over the course of time, I, my goal is to constantly beat my projections. You know, I want to under promise and overperform. Um, we'll talk about the projects that we're doing. We'll have a CapEx tracker, uh, on a quarterly basis. We'll upload financials to our, our portal. Um, we'll put the K1 on the portal when it's done. Uh, if there's a major event that's happening, you know, or like COVID hit, you know, we're, we're talking to investors twice a month because that news cycle is so short. So if anything uh, is going on um, that's very important, we'll, we'll communicate, well, you know, twice a month per se. But typically uh, every single month, we'll also do a semi-annual call to go over performance of our properties as well. Um, but we're always available for questions or concerns from any of our investors, uh, too. We'll get back to them right away because, you know, if, you, if you're investing in something, you want to make sure that, uh, that there's excellent communication. And, and I've invested in other people's deals and I have not received it. And, and so my thought is, I, you know, I, I won't invest with those again. Um, I'm going to invest with the people that um, I know, like and trust and communicate well, you know, simple as that. And um, does it ever happen with you? Any investor showed too much concern what is happening and asking too many questions, even though you were feeling like, why he's asking so many questions? You know, um, thankfully, um, we haven't had that issue. I think we set up really good expectations from the beginning. Our communication is good. So 
there's a lot of information there. Now, I get not every investor reads the newsletter sometimes and they'll ask a question, hey, what, you know, what are we doing with X? And, um, well, we, we've explained it before, but, you know, I'll, I'll take the time to explain it to, to them and walk it through. Um, but yeah, we've, you know, knock on wood, we, we haven't had a, an issue before, you know, and I, I have to say it's probably from our really good communication, you know. Nice. And what kind of tools do you recommend or system do you recommend for efficient and effective asset management? Yeah, um, you don't really have to spend a lot of money on 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 uh, tools. You know, Google Drive is free, and so we have everything there. Um, we were using RealPage in the past for KPIs, and um, we're able to manufacture the KPIs ourselves. And getting them to install the system just took forever. It was just very very frustrating. But you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money uh, to have really good uh, asset management tools. But you know, we also subscribe to to Yardi. You know, there's a mm -hmm. you can do CoStar other things, and and so when we're looking at new deals, that'll help us provide a lot of information. We can look at comps. You know, the also our property management company will provide information based on. You know, we'll we'll do um, we'll run comps for our properties as well to see what what if they're offering concessions, where the rents are, stuff like that. So we can always know where the competition. Uh, sits compared to our property got it got it and are you using any ai tools for asset management at this point we we aren't um that's something that we'll start looking at uh, you know um you know o over the next uh few months but yes we should be um utilizing ai more for for what we do um and we've talked about it as a team and um you know, we've got to find ways to, to take advantage of it. Nice. nice. And uh, can you also share some sort of challenges that you faced in the start when you had a first deal for the asset management at that point? Yeah. Um, you know, you, um, you know, I guess in the beginning we, we you know, struggled, you know, we didn't have the systems down, you know, so we're, con you know, in the beginning, we were constantly tweaking our systems, improving them, what's working, what's not. And even now we still tweak how, how we do things to, you know, maybe information is uh, certain information that we ask for just isn't useful anymore for that deal or for, for this time period. So we're constantly tweaking and looking, how can we improve? How can we be more efficient? Because, you know, time is so valuable so we want to make sure we, we're getting the most amount of information in the least amount of time and you know we don't want to uh, burden our uh, property management team filling in five million things we want to make it as easy as possible for them um, so they can um, use your it's, it's user friendly for them too because if it's really hard and a lot of information they don't have the time nor do they want to fill it out so we want to make sure that um, you know that it's it's easy and um, quick for them to, to to fill out. Got it, got it. And um, since economy is changing a lot from last two years, how are you approaching value add properties in this market? And what kind of criteria are you using? Yeah, you know, I don't think our criteria really has changed. I mean, we obviously want a much higher going in cap rate and some cash flow, whereas previous deals didn't necessarily cash flow as much. Um, we're underwriting with a higher reversion cap, lower, lower um, loan to value on the debt, higher, a higher cost of capital. So you, as long as you put it all in your underwriting, um, that really helps you. Uh, determine if it's a good deal or not. You know, we're seeing deals with, you know, 20% discount these days. We really like that. Um, and, um, you know, just be conservative with your numbers, have lots of reserves for, you know, cash reserves for things, you know, HVAC, uh, plumbing, roof. And even though, you know, when we do DD, they could be um, in good shape you know, things break down all the time. So you want to make sure you really have those, you know, nice cash reserves, even if it lowers the IR just a little bit, that's fine because you don't want to do a cash call. Um, you don't want um, to be in a position where you're squeezed on, on cash flow. Um, so, 
just having those buffers is really important. You know, don't go for the highest IRR. You don't want those investors. You know, go for uh, you know, like I said before, under promise and over deliver. Go for a nice, you know, um, you know, we we kind of target a you know fourteen to to sixteen IRR. And if we, you know, we we know the we know the 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 sub markets really well in Phoenix and Tucson because we've been operating there. So it really gives us a competitive advantage versus other properties, uh, other operators. Sorry. Got it. Got it. And um, what do you want to say about like there are so many operators who are doing cash calls from the last the from the properties they bought last two years? What do you want to make a comment about that? Like why and where did they lack that they had to make a cash calls? Yeah, you know um, it's unfortunate for investors, and I know and, and no operator wants to do a cash call, um, but obviously the rates you know jumped up really fast and, and, and much higher than anyone expected, much higher than I expected. Um, and, and so some of these operators just don't have the balance sheet, the liquidity to help cover some of these loans. So they're getting really squeezed on, on, on making, covering the debt service. Um, you know, for me, you know, I make sure I have a really nice, uh, uh, amount of liquidity on the sideline so that I can, if there are any shortfalls, uh, that can help cover it and not have to do a cash call. We've never done a cash call, nor do we ever plan to. But you know, you never know. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, it's 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 tough for a lot of people. We have some floating debt uh, as well. Um, you know, on one of the properties, we do have uh, uh, some debt service that's that's a little bit higher than our cash flow, and so I've been covering it a little bit, but. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 an unfortunate time, and what's going to be really hard over the next year or, or two is these deals that are are their loan is coming due or their cap rate is expiring. So there's going to be some opportunity out there. Now I don't see a tsunami of deals, but there's definitely going to be some opportunity out there, and you're starting to see a little bit now as well. Yeah. And what do you think? What's the main thing? Any main KPIs or anything, the most indicators, most operators overseeing in asset management, and how do you, how do they can avoid those things? Um, you know, I think breaking down every every aspect of what you're measuring is really important. So when you're looking at leasing, you know, if you're ninety five percent occupied, I want to know what percentage per unit type. Because some unit types, I might be at 100%, and one unit type, I might be at 80 and so the average is now 95 So that, that unit type that's at 80%, maybe I need to lower that rent just a little bit or get, give a little bit of concession so I can get those leased up already. And the other ones that are close to 100%, I could push them. So you know, breaking that down, breaking down unit renovation time, you know, it's not looking at when they're all done you know, or, or it's just it's either getting renovated or done. I want to know each, each at each inflection point, when, when it's coming um, uh, up for renovation, when we start work on it, when each, each of the items that need to be done um, have been completed and when we're putting it back on the market so that I could see any bottlenecks. So really breaking down every single task is really important versus not looking at it uh, as, as a whole. Got it, got it, got it. Um, and um, so you have multiple properties, and how do you allocate your resources to get proper, efficient asset management that you can be present for communication everywhere? Yeah. So uh, every Monday, um, we have all of our asset management calls back to back to back. So we know, boom, we're going to have, um, for, for one property management company, we'll have five calls back to back every 15 minutes. You know, some are a little shorter, some are a little longer, but we'll go through every single property. We'll tour the properties uh, on a monthly basis. You know, we don't always say, hey, we're coming by. You know, we'll do some secret shopping. We want to catch them doing something good. We're not trying to catch them doing something bad, but it's important to to not always let them know when you're coming and to do at different times. You know, maybe on a Friday afternoon to make sure that, you know, they're, they're still there, you know, and, and working away. Um, we uh, we also secret shop it. So we'll send, you know, uh, via email or a call, 
hey, we're looking to rent an apartment and how quickly do they get back to us? Do they answer our specific questions? Do they do a follow up? So there are all these little checks and balances that we do to ensure that the team is operating at a very high standard that we've set. And um, yeah, um, that's right. So for your new deals, what kind of attitude that you are seeing from investors in this point, in this yeah. market? Yeah, you know, um, it's not the easiest time to, to raise capital. I know a lot of people are out there saying that. Um, you know, uh, when, when we, we've, we're under contract right now for our first deal in about nine months. And so you'll get a big rush of investors that have been wanting to. And then your, your, your second level investors, there's kind of a lack of urgency. You know, there's, there's a little deer in the headlights kind of feeling they're, they're hearing all this negative news on, on the media, but really this is a good opportunity, opportunistic time to put your money. It's, you know, with the right operator, with the right business plan, you know, it's, people should need to invest with the right jockey, the right operator versus the highest IRR, because that's, you're going to lose every time if you're just chasing IRR. You've got to invest with someone that you know, like, and trust um, that has performed, you know, um, uh, very well multiple times, um, that knows their submarket. You know, that's the, the type of uh, operator that an investor should invest out there. And um, put their money to work. You know, it's it's a good time to buy. There's some there's some good deals out there, and um, you know, waiting for this perfect time of like, oh, there's this going to be a tsunami of great deals out there. There there might be some good deals out there, uh, but there's some good deals out there now. And so I'm putting my money to work uh, now. I'm not waiting. I'm I'm still going to be buying good deals down down the road. But um, you know, with, we're, we'll look back in six months and say, this might have been like a great time to buy. I don't want to miss out on that opportunity. I feel, I feel good about our, our underwriting and our business plan. And, um, you know, I have a lot of people that, that feel the same way. And um, in today's deal, what kind of debt are you targeting? Yeah, so uh, every deal is, is a little different. Um, right now, you're seeing uh, a lot of agency debt out there. Um, but you know, that's gone, it slid back in the last month to, you know, where we were quoted probably closer to 66% uh, loan to purchase price. And now we're at 52%. Um, the uh, two debt uh, deals that we're looking at right now, one's a CMBS loan, which gives us um, the, the longer term fixed financing uh, and the, and a higher uh, loan to purchase price. Um, they're, you know, they're a little harder to, to deal with, but, um, you know, that's a, that's a good option. You're also seeing some short-term fixed uh, rates out there too, like a, a two plus one. Um, uh, there, there is very little um, floating. Uh, well, there is, there's, there's definitely some floating out there. there it's a, the rate is super high and you have to buy a cap as well. So, you know, getting the right debt on a deal is super, super important. So make sure, you know, for for a deal, we might have 20 different models based on how the debt is changing and and different options. So we want to see, you know, what's the best option for us, you know, prepayment penalty, um, the cost to close, like all these different factors that play in. I want to see how it plays out um, and, and, and make the best informed decision from there. Got it, got it. That's a great answer. And what comment do you want to make about the one we saw in Houston? Um, they foreclosed on almost $200 million of property. What do you think where they lacked? Yeah, you know, I, I feel really bad for the investors. Um, really disappointing. They 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 put their trust in, in the wrong person, and he didn't have a good team around him. Um I'm not sure if they had an, even an asset manager. He didn't really know the the, the submarket. When he talked to other people in that area, they knew that that property, those properties that he was buying, were in a horrible neighborhood, um, very rough. And so um, he's, you know, in his business plan, he talked about all these things that he could not execute, and he wasn't paying his bills. So. You know, at, you know, he didn't have the right integrity, unfortunately. He didn't have the right business plan. He didn't have the right people around him. So, 
he had a, it was an uphill battle for those investors. There was, you know, you could, it's, it's hard to make it through something like that, you know. Do you think those people were um, eagerly buying just, just for the sake of buying? Motivational buyer. Yeah, you, I mean, you have to, you have to wonder what that uh, person's motive was. You know, were they just getting the fees and just buying stuff and, you know, real estate, like anything, you, you have to play for the long haul. You, you can do really well in this business, but, you know, treat, you know, investors come first, a hundred percent. You've got to take care of your investors and your business will continue to grow. If you find good deals and take care of your investors, you're going to be in this for a long time. But, you know, that, if that means taking less money, putting more money in to help a deal, whatever it is. You know, so be it, you know, um, take care of your investors. They're, they're entrusting you with their hard earned money. So you better, you better take that huge fiduciary responsibility seriously. Got it. Got it. And, um, beside approaching deals, what else are you working on? Yeah. So we just launched a fund a few weeks ago. Um, we're going to put three to five value add multifamily deals in this and uh, our first property is a property in Tucson. This is our ninth deal in Tucson. The, uh, the basis is phenomenal. It's three, um, we have three properties within five miles of this, of this property. And right off the bat, we can install a, a low flow, uh, toilets and fixtures and save, you know, 50 to $75,000, um, off our water bill. And when you divide it by the cap rate, I mean, we're talking a tremendous amount of value from day one to be, to be had. Nice. And how big is the fund? So the fund will, um, we're looking to raise about 35 to 50 million and we'll do about 75 to a hundred million of assets under, under that, under that fund. The first deal is 256 units and 34 and a half million dollars, uh, to purchase the property. Got it. Got it. And you also mentioned something about asset management summit. Can you share something about that too? Yeah, um, we haven't done it in a while, but we did run a, an asset management summit a couple of years ago. We had a, on, it was online, and we had uh, eighteen hundred people show up the first time, um, and we just you know shared uh, best practices. Um, but you know, we talk a lot about that on my podcast, the Real Estate Investor Podcast. We've we've done over one hundred and sixty episodes, and the bulk of them are on asset management. And and just one one piece of it, we don't go into the real estate journey. So it's just quick information about, you know, one, one specific topic. And, um, it was a great way for me to learn, uh, and, and rocket fuel, my knowledge base, you know, I'd bring on, you know, friends or other people that, um, had a particular expertise, um, that I wanted to learn from. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, we release a new episode every Friday. Perfect. Perfect. So what advice do you want to give to somebody who just starting in real estate? Yeah, um, real estate is a team sport. So, so get involved in a group. And we met at uh, um, a Phoebe meetup yesterday, a local a real estate meetup, which is great because you're around like minded people, you're learning, you're networking, you never know when your ne next investor or partner is coming from or someone that could, hey, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not looking for a 41 unit building in Tucson. But when a broker calls me, I can pass it on to a friend that might be looking for it. So, you, you know, you never know. You got to get out there. You got to be around other people um, because that just that provides that energy to keep going and, and striving. You might not remember, but I remember that when the first time I met you, it was uh, Intelligent Investors and you gave me the book. I'm like, I need to read. I need to. But at that point, I had no idea about real estate. I'm like, I, I need to learn. And this book is great. And yeah, you said it right. It's a team sport. You learn from each other. And um, I'm going to ask you two, three more questions. That's on a mindset. Be ready for that. So what's your morning routine as an entrepreneur? Well, first thing, I like to get my body moving. You know, that helps wake up my mind, helps wake up my body. So, um, you know, I, just, I played volleyball this morning at 6.45. You know, I'm back, back home by 8.30, have a shower, protein shake. I'm at the desk by like 8.45, you know, and other mornings I have a workout at six or I'll just walk outside for a couple miles, listen to a podcast. 
that helps me be energized for the day. Um, you know, having the right mindset is really important too, because, you know, some days you feel like you're rub- running up a hill, um, um, with a, with a, you know, heavy backpack on and you're herding cats and it doesn't go the way you want, but having the right mindset is so important. Um, you know, it's, it's a long game and, um, you know, just every single day, if you could, you know, climb a little higher, you know, you're going to, you're going to get there, you know, do the work, love the process. And, and, and sometimes I have a problem with that. I, I you know, you want to get to a deal, you want to have a deal and, you know, and, and, uh, um, but you, you know, we, like I said, we haven't had a deal in like nine months. We've been another time where we didn't have a deal for like, I don't know, 10, 11, 13, you know, 13 months. Trust the process. You're every, every rep that you're doing, you're gaining more knowledge. You're getting better at what you do. And so, um, do, you know, do the work. Got it. Got it. If you have to go back in time and start all over again, what would you do different? Yeah, I'd get into real estate sooner and I'd have a, I have a build out my team quicker. You know, um, I can't do everything myself. So having other people around me that, that I could take out tasks that are, you know, maybe a $10 or $20 task, you know, I could pass on to someone else and I could focus on the higher, higher dollar amount tasks, like maybe raising capital or talking to brokers, you know. Got it. Got it. So if today is the last day on this planet, what message do you want to give to the world? You live your best life, you know, um, life is short. Um, so have fun doing what you're doing, be good to others and, um, you challenge yourself, you know, um, life is boring when you don't challenge yourself. So if you do, you, you'll live a very fulfilling life. If you, if you do those three things, have a goal in life. All right, Gary, thank you so much for explaining everything about asset management and, uh, I really, really appreciate it. I really appreciate your time. And I'll see you in another meetup. <laughs> Sounds great. All righty. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you for joining us on The Real Deal, a commercial real estate investing podcast. The show that covers everything to do with multifamily real estate investing to help you become an expert in your real estate ventures. We're here to help you create passive income and financial freedom so that you can achieve what you want whenever you want. We'll catch you next time on The Real Deal.